Hello, one, two, three, four, five. Hello, hello, hello. Just about to start an interview. Um, I had um, bananas for breakfast and croissant and Edbert Marmalade. Yeah. Und Rührei. Yeah. Owner spec. Owner schinken, owner spec. So you're a veggie? No, I love ham, actually. But uh, in, in Germany, there's this thing where they, they, they make scrambled egg and they chop little bits of speck in it. Yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> I want the Rührei here and the sausage and the bacon here, you know? <laughs> Hello, my name is Simon Phillips, and I'm very pleased to be here on Drum Talk to talk about drums. The biggest compliment that I think uh, I've ever been paid is you play musically. You sound very musical in the playing. And that's something to me is probably the biggest compliment I, I ever had. It's very important to me, musicality. Um, because of the nature of the instrument, the nature of the drums, and the fact that a lot of drummers don't study composition, harmony, counterpoint, all the stuff that most musicians, kind of, even if they don't study, it's part of their instrument. They need to know what an A flat is, you know, G sharp, uh, E, E flat minor, uh, C, uh, C sus4, you know. We as drummers don't really need to do that. Uh, there are many drummers that do know that, but it's not that important to be able to play well and to play music well. So there's a problem right away, the musicality of playing with other musicians. This happens with other musicians too. It doesn't have to be just the drummer. It could be the bass player, the guitar player. But some people are just more musical than others. There's more give and take. They listen more rather than just listening to themselves. So that's a concept that I've been into for, for many, many years now. And I played a very large kit for a very long time. And I remember dragging my double bass drum, eight Tom Tom, Ludwig Octoplus around the London studios. And the general consensus is, oh boy, you know, we're gonna get lots of drum fills and everything, you know. But that doesn't bear any relation to the kid at all. I could do a session where it's just kick and snare and hat for the whole song. If that suits the song, that's great. Just because I've got eight toms doesn't mean that it has to be a, you know, a, a solo. And I think that's one of the stigmas uh, back then, back in the 70s and the 80s of using a large drum kit. I think a lot of people that now know my playing know that it's not necessary. They know me for the large kit, but they also know that if we're gonna play a rock and roll song or simple ballad, it's going to be exactly that. I may hit that tom and that tom in the whole song. It's just, that's my instrument, just like a piano. I treat it like that, and I treat the drum kit as a sum of all the parts. A lot of people just see it as, here's the snare, here's the kick, here's the toms, here's the res, you know, separate things. And a lot of engineers treat it like that. And when you do a sound check and you come in and listen, you just go, hmm, individually, it sounds okay, but there's no cohesion. It's gotta sound like one instrument, and that's the drum kit. And that's, that again is one of my big, big concepts. I mean, there's lots of other percussion instruments. There's the piano which is a percussion instrument, technically. So, you know, the, yes, there's lots of different percussion instruments and uh, they tend to be a lot more, you know, contained and usually one type. Uh, the tabla uses two types of different drums. Congas have different sizes, you know, the tumba, the conga. But generally, no, the drum kit has the most parts of, actually, of any Western music recording, radio or, or live. Uh, you go into the studio, you may have two channels for guitar, maybe three, two channels for the bass, left and right for the keyboards, for one keyboard, you know. The drum kit, well, even a small kit is gonna be nine or 10 channels, ambience mics and stuff, so that's why the concept 
of the drum kit is so important to me that it is uh, looked at as, as a single instrument. I was very lucky that I was, I was born into a, a musical family. My father was a band leader, so, you know, I mean, you get a chart and there's actually um, dynamic markings on a chart. You know, mezzo forte, forte, double forte, pianissimo, molto pianissimo, you know, all this kind of stuff. So from an early age, yes, of course, I, I learned that. And also, when you play jazz, you play in a band, you also learn which instruments you need to learn how to play behind. You're playing and the trumpet player's playing, right? So in a, in a big band scenario, that's pretty, you know, it's, it, the trumpet is a loud instrument. And generally when he's playing, depending on the song, of course, um, it's usually up there. So you're playing to support the trumpet player. The next solo is a bass solo. Bass is, especially in upright, is a very quiet instrument. And if he's soloing, he has to be heard. So everybody in the band has to leave space, both dynamically and also what you play too. You know, what you decide to play tonally. If a bass solo is playing, you probably wouldn't play the floor tom-tom because -tom, that's a big sound. It occupies too much low end. You won't hear the bass notes. So that's why when you look at these uh, big bands, usually for, for bass solos, they, it's a tight hi-hat sound. You know, and maybe the edge of the stick against the stem as, a, as the backbeat, but it's quiet. You know, so those that those are things you learn very early on. But there's also something lovely about um, a band that plays very dynamically, different sections of the song. We we do this a lot with Protocol. Uh, really wanted to get a very dynamic band. When we start the solos, we start very very quiet, and it, it's great for the listener. It's very exciting, and it's not just dynamics in loud and soft. It's dynamics in terms of how full everybody's playing. A big chord as opposed to just a couple of notes, you know, leaving space in the music. It's, it's very, very important. And I guess that's something I've learned over the years to do, which brings me back to musicality. And musicality, you just learn by playing with great musicians. And I've been very lucky all my life to always play with pretty much better musicians than I was because I was very young. You know, I was in the London studios when I was 16, 17 years old. The youngest guy was probably 25, 26, and most of them were in their 40s. So all the session guys I used to work with, people like Herbie Flowers and all these you know, wonderful players, Big Jim Sullivan used to play with uh, Tom Jones. Uh, George Fenton, who writes lots of uh, film scores now. Um, I learned from playing with all these wonderful people. things that you can't do. Um, that's always a cool thing. You have to be very creative. And this again is the musical approach. Let's say you have a little thing that you want, you want to practice that's kind of tricky to do. And you practice it a bit and you slow it down. And what I do is if I can't do it, I keep slowing it down. And if I can't do it, I keep slowing it down. I make sure my time is really uh, precise. That's the one thing about practicing. Make sure your time is precise because then you can practice time too. Very important. And something that's awkward physically is going to sound weird time-wise. So that's another thing you have to work on. So if you slow it down, subdivide in your head so you're kind of twice the speed in the head like a, like a shaker, you know? but you don't play a shake, you just, you just imagine it. And then you do this weird sticking and weird footing until it starts to come. And then you add the other hand in. And if you can't add the other hand, leave it out and sing it. 
That's a really important thing. Sing it first. Your brain has to sort out what's going on. Now, once you learn to sing it, that doesn't mean you can play it yet because then you've got to send messages from here to there. And this is the amazing thing. And you can almost feel it going on. You can feel, I can, you can feel the syntaxes going because as you're trying to operate one hand, which is probably going against what your this side of the body is doing, you can feel the tension. You can almost feel your brain trying to make connection. Again, slow it back down again. You'll be able to do it quicker by singing it. Slow it back down to physically doing it. And then once you start to get it, take a break and then, then go to a different tempo. I think a lot of people would end it there. They'll go, they'll just try to get quicker and quicker and quicker. What if you extend the, 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 the obstacle, the practice, and turn it into something else? But you have to have your imagination. Because I'll start doing that, and I'll get, once I get it, I'm kind of like, okay, what's next, musically? And I go, what if we do threes on each limb? So that, that's a very important thing about practice. You, you can make practice very creative, or you can make it extremely boring. It's your choice. I treat it all the same. It's just, you play for the music. Metal is gonna be a little less dynamic. A standard metal is gonna be eighth notes. You know, if you... There's an instant riff right there. So what are you gonna go? You're going... You know? And then you can either go ACDC on it, which is that, or you can go a little bit more progressive, you know, more like like uh, uh, Deep Purple or even Zeppelin, where it, maybe it'll be, you know what I mean? Going with the guitar riff as opposed to ignoring the guitar riff. Both are valid. I actually did a rehearsal with ACDC once. It was the fun, most fun time. I didn't end up doing the record because it just, yeah, they needed just, that's all they needed. Bad, bad, you know? But it was great, we had a great time. It was lovely. But it, it is, it's a very particular sound and a particular groove, you know? And it's lovely. That's, that's what it's about. I mean, if we're talking about metal or talking about rock, yeah, you're not, I mean, we, we incorporate a lot of that in this. And especially the fact that Andy and I come from a more rock and roll background, we can bring that into what we play. And it's there. You'll notice some of the songs are more rocky and they have that rock and roll sensibility. I was on a session and I was, we got a drum sound, we were ready to go and I said, do you have a chart? And I said, yeah, I got a chart. Maybe even without the chart, they play me the demo. Or they might just play the track off the multi-track with just a click with no drum part, especially in those days. And I'm listening to the song, I'm going, yeah, or I'm following it on a, on a chart and I'm going, oh, I know what I'm gonna do. I know what this song needs. And that's where the groove kind of starts. Pattern, the bass drum pattern, the backbeat, what the hi-hat's gonna do. It's already formulating as soon as I hear the music. But the funny thing is, when I go out to the studio, sit down, put the headphones on, pick up the sticks, I said, okay, I'm ready, roll the tape. Um, I start playing something totally different. And I don't do what was in my head. It's so strange. It's, but that's just intuitive. You'll just start playing something that intuitively works with the music. 
hopefully. <laughs> now, obviously, there are choices to be made, and there's many ways to play a song, but that's what you have a producer for. So generally what would happen, I'll go in and I'll play what I feel is the most natural thing to play with what I'm hearing and what the song is about and everything. And then he might go, okay, that's cool, but you know, I really want to keep the, uh, I really like that bass drum pattern. It may not go with the music so much, but I like the fact that it's always anchored. Okay, well, what is that pattern? Okay, yeah, I can, I can do that, no problem. It, but groove just, I don't know. It just, it just comes. And when you're writing music, you're writing a song, uh, you, you just come up with a, with a groove and, and then you develop it and then the other guys come play it and, and there you go, there you have it. I taught myself to play left-handed. I was right-handed up until 1975, and about halfway through 75, and I was 18 years old, I started changing. And I was doing, I started doing a lot of recording dates, and you know, recording dates pretty much is all about groove. So I didn't have to worry about working on the technique, I had to worry about working on the sound. And I just, I actually did it mostly on a sofa because I was living in, a, in an apartment in London. I couldn't bring my drums in. So I just watched myself playing a rhythm and then I'd swap it over. And I'd try to make it sound the same. That was the difficult thing. And I'd turn up to sessions, I'd lowered my hi-hat. I had a ride cymbal here just in case so I could go, you know, like that. Um, it was uh, early 1976 actually, so less than a year. I grabbed that ride cymbal and I put it over here and I started playing lefty. Uh, super drumming. Yeah, Pete York called me up and told me about his plan and what he wanted to do and I said, that sounds great. Uh, give me a call, let me know. He got in touch with me again and said, okay, we've actually booked time, we're booking drummers and everything. Do you, you, you want to do this? I said, great, fantastic. I was in Barbados with Mick Jagger. We were recording Primitive Cool. And I remember I had to fly back. I flew from the Caribbean to London and then flew to Munich. And then somebody picked me up in the car and we drove out to the church where it was done, an old church. And I think they had just finished with Louis Balsam. And I got there in the afternoon. I think I watched a little bit of what they were doing and uh, my, I was set for the next day. And then, I don't know, I can't remember how it came up or maybe I suggested it, I can't remember. Uh, wow, Louis here? We should do something together. And Louis was like, absolutely, let's do it. I'm here tomorrow. So they didn't break down his kit. We got my kit and we set it up. And that's why it's kind of to the left because his was set up for his filming, right? And they didn't want to move it. So, and that's I'm kind of further to the left and the band is kind of to the right, Brian Auger. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was great. Um, and we did this, I don't know how many takes we did, but one, two takes or something. And, and that was it. I don't even remember what we did outside of that. All I remember is what, what I did with Louis because I just remember being just like elated, um, a little bit nervous, um, and just in awe of his playing, you know, and playing with this icon. It was amazing, here I'm, you know, it, it was great. It was, so it was, it was really special, really special that, that day. I mean, we were done and it was a day, I'm pretty sure. And then I was bye-bye and off to the airport and back to uh, Heathrow. <laughs> But it was a, a wonderful um, series. And I think you're right, it, it really did, it made a big impact, especially in Germany, when it was put on uh, German TV. Uh, so many people have come up with that DVD, and well, it used to be the VHS, and now the DVD, and you, you know, so it's great. I haven't seen Pete in a long time.
Well, thank you very much for watching Drum Talk. It's been a lot of fun. I hope some of it made sense. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much.